We have a problem in turning out enough science and math graduates, right, uh, in this country. And it's not for lack of interest, by the way, among high school seniors. Lots and lots and lots of high school seniors want to get science and math degrees, but approximately half of them drop out by the end of their second year. So we have a persistence problem in science and math education in this country. So the question is why? Why do so many kids drop out? Well, the obvious answer is that science and math are really hard, and you need to have a certain level of cognitive ability to master those subjects, and we don't have enough smart kids, right? So, um, uh, so if, you, if that's true, uh, if science and math education is a function of, uh, we should be able to see in the statistics that persistence is a function of your cognitive ability. This is, I've just chosen Hartwick College as a proxy for American colleges for totally random reasons. Hartwick is a small liberal arts college in upstate New York. And what we have here is a distribution of math SAT scores by among the people who are intending to major in science and math. And what you can see is that there is quite a wide range of native math ability among the kids entering the freshman uh, STEM programs at Hartwick, right? So what, we was, so what do we see when we, when we look at uh, the who ends up graduating with a STEM degree? What we see is that at Hartwick College, the kids with, in the top third, with the top third SAT scores, end up getting well over half of the STEM degrees, and the kids with the bottom scores end up getting very few of the STEM degrees. Those kids over there are dropping out like flies. Right? This would seem to suggest that our original hypothesis that persistence as a function of cognitive ability is true. And this would also, we can also go further, we can say if this hypothesis is true, as we go to more and more selective institutions, we should see a very different pattern of persistence. We should see less kids dropping out because the kids are all smarter. Right? So let's go to Harvard. These numbers are a few years old, but at Harvard, you can see that the bottom third of math SAT scores among kids doing science and math are equal to the top third at Hartwick. The dumb students at Harvard are as smart as the smart students at Hartwick. So you'd think everybody at, Har at Harvard should be getting a math and science degree, right? Why would they drop out? Everyone's so smart. What do we see? Oh, dear. What we see is the exact same pattern at Harvard that we saw at Hartwick. The smart kids are, the top kids are getting all the degrees. The kids at the bottom aren't getting any degree. They're dropping out like flies, right? Even though these kids are brilliant. Well, clearly what we're seeing here is that uh, persistence in science and math is not simply a function of your cognitive ability. It's a function of your relative standing in your class. It's a function of your class rank, right? Those kids who are really, really brilliant don't get their math degree, not because uh, that is a function of their IQ, but as a function of where they are in their class. And by the way, if you look at any college you want, you will always see, regardless of the level of cognitive ability among the students, you will always see the same pattern. The kids who get the science and math degrees are the ones in the top of their class, and the kids in the bottom of their class never do. So the name given for this phenomenon um, among psychologists is relative deprivation theory. And it describes this exceedingly robust phenomenon, uh, which says that as human beings, we do not form our self-assessments based on our standing in the world. We form our self-assessments based on our standing in, the, in our immediate circle, on those in the same boat as ourselves. Right? So a classic example of relative deprivation theory is which kind of country, which countries have the highest suicide rates? Happy countries or unhappy countries? And the answer is happy countries, right? If you're morbidly depressed in a country where everyone else is really unhappy, you don't feel that unhappy, right? <laughs> you're not comparing yourself to the universe, the whole universe of people out there, no. You're con comparing yourself to your neighbors and the kids at school, and they're unhappy too, so you're sort of fine. But if you're morbidly uh, depressed in a country where everyone is jumping up and down for joy, you are really depressed, right? That is a very, very, very profoundly serious place to be. And so, as a result, um, you get that sad outcome uh, more often. 
So what's happening at Harvard then is the kid in the bottom third of his class at Harvard does not say, rationally, I am in the 99.99th percentile of all students in the world when it comes to native math ability, even though that's true. What that kid says is, that kid over there, Johnny over there, is getting all the answers right, and I'm not. I feel like I'm really stupid, and I can't handle math, so I'm going to drop out, get a fine arts degree, move to Brooklyn, work, make $15,000 a year, and break my parents' heart, right? <laughs> so what is the implication of this? The implication of this is that if you want to get a science and math degree, don't go to Harvard, right? In fact. We can run the numbers on this. Mitchell Chang at UCLA recently did the numbers, and he says, he, as a rule of thumb, your odds of graduating, persisting, successfully getting a science and math degree, uh, fall by two percentage points for every 10-point increase in the average SAT score of your peers. So if you're a kid and you have a choice between uh, if you and University of Maryland is your safety, University of Maryland has 150 as on average, SAT scores are 150 points lower at Maryland. That means your chance of graduating with a STEM degree from Maryland is 30% higher than it would be at Harvard, right? Now, so if you choose to go to Harvard and not Maryland, you are taking an enormous gamble. You are essentially, you're essentially saying this STEM degree, by the way, the most valuable commodity any college graduate can have in today's economy, I am going to take a 30% gamble in my chances of getting that degree, just so I can put Harvard on my resume. Is that worth it? I don't think so. When it comes to confidence and motivation and self-efficacy, the things that really matter when it comes to making your way in the world, relative position matters more than absolute position. Right? The 80th percentile student at Harvard looks at those kids who are smarter than him and says, I can't do it. The number one student at Missouri says, wow, I am lord of the manor. I'm going to go out and conquer the world, right? So what does it mean? Well, what it means, what it means, first of all, when it comes to hiring, it means you should hire on the basis of class rank. And you should be completely indifferent to the institution attended by the applicant. In fact, we should have a don't ask, don't tell policy for the name of your undergraduate institution. It's hurting us to know that. Doesn't help us. And when you hear some institution, some fabulous Wall Street investment bank, some university say, we only hire from the top schools, you should say, you moron, hire from the top stu students from any school under the sun. Right? And it also means that when it comes, if you have kids going to college, when it comes to choosing your undergraduate institution, you should never go to the best institution you get into, never. Go to your second or your third choice. Go to the place where you're guaranteed to be in the top part of your class. Right? So why don't we do that? Well, why did I come here when it was <laughs> profoundly in my self-interest not to? Right? Because when we have an opportunity to join elite institutions, we are so enormously flattered and pleased with ourselves that we do things that are irrational.